Welcome back. Now we've already talked about the idea that there are processes in the cell that release energy, processes in the cell that uh, consume energy, use energy. And it would be really nice if we could have energy producing processes, exergonic processes, occurring right next to some endergonic process. So the energy released from one could be used by the other. Unfortunately, that's not the way in which the cell is designed, and many of these reactions occur in very different locations within the cell. So what do we need? We need an energy shuttle molecule, something that can carry energy from one location to another. So let's consider now the molecule called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And you can think of it as an energy delivery truck or an energy shuttle molecule. In chemical reactions like cellular respiration that we're going to talk about in quite a bit of detail later, we're going to talk about it as having a key function of releasing energy, producing energy that can be used to make ATPs. Those ATPs are then going to be used, they're the primary short-term energy molecule for powering virtually all of the activities in the cell. We'll mention a few other energy molecules that contribute to short-term energy storage, GTP for example, but ATP will be our primary molecule that's involved in shuttling the energy between different regions. We could call ATP a molecule that couples, links together chemical reactions. Well, this ATP molecule is a modified nucleotide. Remember, nucleotides have a sugar, a nitrogenous base, and then a single phosphate group. ATP, on the other hand, has three phosphate groups attached. The T, triphosphate, implies that nature of the molecule. Now, the interesting thing is that when you break off that final phosphate group through hydrolysis, there's a release of energy. Energy that can be used to do some kind of work, to cause some kind of change in the cell. Think of that last phosphate as being like, uh, I usually tell people to think of it like a jack-in-the-box. If you're familiar with a jack-in-the-box, you have a head, a body that you have to push down on a spring and compress it. And then you put the lid over it with a very, very, what, light latch attached to it. By a light one, I mean that it's ready to spring open at a very little provocation. The same thing is true for this phosphate group. Think about if I have two phosphate groups that I'm trying to force them together, make them connect to each other. Well, as you might imagine, those two groups with all those electron hog oxygens, negative charges, they really don't want to be pushed together. So I have to use a lot of energy to attach a phosphate group to an ADP, a lot of energy used to create that bond. But that bond has a hair trigger. It's ready to break at a moment's notice and that phosphate group be released. So that's what you want to think about when you're thinking about this ATP molecule as storing energy. We start with an ADP, add a phosphate group using a lot of energy, and then when that phosphate group is released later, it provides energy to whatever the phosphate group is released to. Well, when we talk about these chemical reactions in the cell and how ATP fits in, we're going to be talking about ATP being a shuttle between exergonic and endergonic reactions. They're linked to each other, and the key linkage that occurs is through ATP. Now, if a cell is going to be efficient, it has to try to be very good at taking much of the energy that's released from exergonic reactions and try to convert that into energy stored in ATP. ATP then can release that to power endergonic reactions. Here's the catch. As you know from what we talked about in terms of the laws of thermodynamics, that with every energy conversion, there's some loss of energy, some wasted energy in the form of heat. And we're going to see that when we talk later about cellular respiration, the way in which your cells generate most of their ATPs, that it's a process that's only about 40% efficient. All right, so that's about the best a cell can do, is take about 40% of the energy in the food molecules taken in by the cell and convert that into energy stored in the ATP molecules. So it's the best a cell can do, and ATP is the most efficient energy shuttling molecule that cells have made use of. Now, if we think about what some of the things are that can be powered by ATP, what does ATP provide energy to do? Well, it might do mechanical work. For example, it might cause the cells in my muscles to shorten, and I can then move my skeleton and move objects with that force. It might be used to move substances across a membrane. We'll talk about a process called active transport in which substances are moved against their concentration gradient across a membrane. 
we're going to see that the primary way to power that is through ATP energy. ATPs also might get involved in chemical reactions. What if I have a particular chemical reaction that requires some energy for that chemical reaction to occur? ATP might get involved with an enzyme that's carrying out, facilitating a chemical reaction, and provide the energy for that chemical reaction to take place. So notice, a variety of potential locations where ATP can be made use of. Well, once again, let's remember what we're suggesting, that ATP forms a link. It's the coupling agent between the exergonic reactions of the cell and the endergonic reactions of the cell. We can think of it this way, that ATP functions in a cyclical fashion. Let's first start at the bottom of the illustration. ADP and a phosphate group. They might gain energy from an exergonic reaction and get turned into ATP. Notice, by the way, that the dehydration synthesis reaction that's talked about is the reaction forming the ATP. Now, be careful here. Listen carefully. That chemical reaction is an endergonic process. All right, so let me restate this again. Notice what we're saying. We're saying that we have energy coming from an exergonic process. What's that energy being used to do? drive an endergonic process of building ATPs. Once I've built the ATP, the ATP can then go through hydrolysis. Hydrolysis is a chemical reaction that is going to release energy. So going from ATP to ADP is an exergonic reaction. And notice where that energy can go. The energy released from the hydrolysis of ATP can go to power provide energy for some endergonic event in the cell. So make sure you realize that in this illustration, there's really four chemical reactions being talked about, right? The initial exergonic reaction, the endergonic reaction to form ATP, the exergonic reaction to break down ATP, and finally, the energy from that breakdown goes to power some endergonic process. So see how ATP functions as a linking mechanism between the exergonic and endergonic processes. We could consider it another way. We could look at it this way. What if I have a protein and it interacts with ATP? Notice what's happening in this interaction. ATP is becoming ADP and its phosphate group has been attached to the protein. Now imagine that phosphate group, well, you can already visualize it because it's a phosphorus with four oxygens four electron hogs, you could almost think of it as like a hot potato. If I toss you a hot potato, you change shape. You respond to that thing that I've just added to you. The same thing happens to proteins or molecules that have phosphate groups attached to them. Attach a phosphate group, my bonding relationships change. My electrons rearrange themselves, and I might go through some kind of change in shape or position. And that's what's being shown here that this protein, when it has its phosphate group attached to it, then undergoes a process of change, a change in shape. Now, the particular protein that's being shown here would be like one of the proteins found in well, one of your muscle cells, or it could be one of those motor proteins we talked about that was found inside of the flagella or the mitochondria. All right, so we're talking about proteins changing shape as a result of gaining a phosphate group from an ATP. That's the way ATP helps molecules gain power, gain energy, um, helps to push them through a chemical reaction. So make sure you think about this whenever you see an illustration showing ATP providing the energy for a chemical reaction to take place. Well, let's go back and think about what we've been looking at. We talked over and over again in this particular presentation about the idea of needing to link together the exergonic and the endergonic reactions that occur within the cell. The energy releasing reactions and the energy consuming reactions. We said that our, th our key linker, our key coupler, is a molecule called ATP, a modified nucleotide. The ATP molecule can convert energy from an exergonic reaction into the production of ATPs, and then the ATP molecule, by breaking down, can release that stored energy and provide power for some endergonic process. This is an important idea that's going to come up over and over again. Make sure you review it 
And I hope you feel comfortable that you understand the basic idea of ATP as a short-term energy storage molecule. Thank you. I'll see you next time.